Hello and welcome to the Genuine Learning Blog. My name is Melissa Galasso and today we're going to talk about the definition of an asset. Now you're likely thinking, Melissa, I'm likely a CPA here and I definitely know the definition of an asset, but in December of 2021, FASB updated the definition of an asset um, by updating Chapter 4 of the Conceptual Framework. So the conceptual framework is not GAP itself. It's the theory that underlies GAP. And so they did not issue an ASU. They issued chapter four uh, of the conceptual framework, which is elements of the financial statements. And so this is used by the board to help develop and write GAP. And what they found was that there were some questions about some of the definitions that were causing difficulty in application. And so as a result, in December, they updated concept statement number eight uh, and specifically chapter four. They also made some changes to chapter one while they were in there and then they issued a separate standard which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks on the blog on presentation. So lots going on in the conceptual theory side of the house for FASB. So as I mentioned elements of financial statements was updated and they really were looking at the definition of our core elements, right? So what is it that we have? What are these things that we put on the financial statements? So they retained the um, the types of elements that we are having. So we have our assets, our liability, and our equity, which would go on our balance sheet. Obviously, if we're a nonprofit, that equity would turn into net assets. So the concept statements address both for-profit entities as well as not-for-profit entities here. Uh, and so they do address the concept of net assets. They also have investment by owners and distribution to owners as transactions that obviously impact that. They also talk about comprehensive income. Uh, nonprofits do not have comprehensive income because they have a statement of activities and not an income statement. So everything flows through the statement of activities. But for for-profit entities, they address the concept of comprehensive income. And then they have revenues, expenses, gains, and losses. And so we're going to look at the uh, definitions that had the largest change uh, and kind of take a, a look at a before and after. So let's take a look at the word, the definition of the word asset. Uh, this is probably the one that for me was the most shocking in terms of reading about because as you can see they took out a lot of verbiage. The new definition of an asset is much shorter than historically. It's an asset is a present right of an entity to an economic benefit. Now the previous definition included concepts like probable future economic benefit, uh, obtained or controlled, and the discussion about what it being a result of a past action or event. And all of these were hotly debated. In fact, this is not a unanimous decision, um, but they decided to remove the concept of probable future. Uh, they talked a little bit about how even if probability was low, um, that didn't necessarily uh, determine that it was not an asset, but it was confusing to individuals. And then they felt like the term obtained or controlled was a little bit redundant because if you have a present right, then that would by definition include control. Now, Christine Bodison does not agree with that, but uh, a key element there. And then this concept of a past transaction. Uh, so they really wanted to make this a little bit of an easier use. So an asset now is a present right to an economic benefit. And they talked about the concept of whether it's an economic resource or economic benefit, and they decided to stay with this economic benefit. Similarly, a liability is also significantly reduced. Uh, so no more discussion of probable future sacrifices. And again, removing this concept of result of past transactions or events. So a liability is simply a present obligation of an entity to transfer an economic benefit. And when we think about obligations, they can come from legal contracts, they could come from statutes or laws, um, they can come from any other, right? So they can be upheld by a judicial system. Um, and so when we think about this, this concept of an obligation, when, and we think about performance obligation for revenue recognition, um, we can think about this concept when we're applying it to the lease liability. Uh, these broader definitions make it a a little bit easier to be able to, um, to recognize these types of liabilities. Now the change between revenues and expenses is, uh, and, and in fact gains and losses, is the same concept. Uh, historically, revenue uh, was differentiated from a gain by the concept of it being a major or, on, uh, or central ongoing operation. So 
we use the example of a nonprofit uh, special event. If this is sort of a one-off event, not super material to the financial statements, historically we recognized it as a gain and we recognized it net. But if it was an ongoing major or central operation, uh, you know, the biggest source of funding that's done every year, we would recognize that as gross revenue and then we'd have a, a related cost of sales item. Um, and so as a result, um, they have removed this concept of ongoing major or central operations from the definition of revenue and from the definition of expenses. Uh, and then you'll see from gains and losses, previously they were described as being peripheral or incidental. Dental, same with our loss calculation. Um, and so this is definitely something that will, um, you know, they, they kind of address some of the, the issues related to this and, and why it is so important. And they kind of beef up some of the conceptual framework related to how we make the decision about whether something is a revenue or a gain or an expense or a loss. Now, as I mentioned earlier, not everybody is on this boat. Uh, Ms. Bodison, Christine Bodison, uh, dissented to the issuance of this. And um, I have a ton of respect for Christine Bodison. She has um, always been willing to speak her mind. It's something that I have always been very, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, happy to see happen in there. Uh, so when she, you know, she's a female on the board, but she always has, you know, a reason. She's well thought out. Her background is in academia. So she's got a really good theoretical thought uh, process. Uh, and she knows the codification. She knows the rules. Um, and she's not, uh, you know, she's not afraid to share her thoughts. And that's something um, that I am so impressed with. Uh, and so, uh, you know, even if I don't agree with her, um, it's not like I always agree with her on everything, but I feel like, you know, that she is a, a great example of someone who is not willing to just accept status quo or be rolled over by the greater majority. She really does try to ensure that all sides are heard. Um, and, uh, you know, her background in academia, I think, is a really important background. And the fact that she's willing to speak up uh, repeatedly, she's dissented a lot over her term. Um, you know, I think that's something that we should all uh, kind of be happy to see in practice as opposed to just sort of, okay, well, everyone else is saying it. So let's all jump off the Brooklyn Bridge, like my mom used to say when we were growing up. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I have the utmost respect for her. I think she does a fa fabulous job. And she disagreed with the removal of the term control from an asset she thinks is important. Uh, we can see the application of control in the lease standard. So I think that's something that they point to. She also uh, felt like the more prescriptive definitions for equity and comprehensive income were a little bit easier to apply. And she didn't like the change in the definitions of revenues, gains, expenses, and losses. So um, if you are feeling a little bit sad about these changes, you are not the only one who disagrees with the change. Um, so you know there are pros and cons to each of them. I would recommend reading the entire uh, conceptual framework there for this chapter four, because I do think it does give a lot of explanation about why they did what they did, but also read the dissent and the basis for conclusion by Christine, because I think it is really helpful uh, to kind of understand what the potential impact of this might be going forward. Now, remember, concept statements are not ASUs, they are not GAP, uh, but they are the theory that they use in the standard setting process to write future GAP. Uh, so it's just something to keep in the back of the mind as we go through there. So as we look at these changes and definitions, what will that mean for the future of standard setting? All right, so that's a wrap for today's uh, blog. Hopefully you have a little bit of a better understanding of what's going on in the theory to GAP uh, and you're aware of some of these changes. Uh, so thank you guys so much for joining me and I hope to see you on a future blog. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.